Hi, everyone. Welcome to the show. I'm Dr. Nicole, and I'm really excited about today's episode because this is a topic that I don't think is talked about nearly enough. We're going to be exploring autism and related kinds of disabilities and the Black community, including understanding how some of the unique stigma around this, the unique struggles of parenting a Black child with autism, and really how we can better meet the needs of Black families who have children on the autism spectrum and with related issues. We're going to get into all of that. And my guest today is Maria Davis-Pierre. She's the founder and CEO of Autism in Black, Inc. This organization aims to bring awareness to autism and reduce the stigma associated with the diagnosis in the Black community. Her unique approach exemplifies her drive and motivation toward greater acceptance and overcoming the barriers and personal struggles associated with raising a Black autistic child. Maria has been featured in Forbes, the New York Times, she's collaborated with Microsoft, and personally has a wealth of experience on this topic. Maria, welcome. Thank you so much for being here with us today. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited to be here. Um, as I said, I think this is really an important topic. It's one that I don't think is talked about enough within the Black community, outside of the Black community, certainly not in the professional realm. And so um, I was telling Maria before the show, I was so excited to come across her information and what she's doing, because this is something that we need to be talking about, right? Most definitely. It is definitely not talked about enough. And, you know, we are dealing with it. We live it daily. So for others not to understand the struggles, you know, it makes it even harder. Absolutely. And I think that there's barriers around access to services. There's barriers around understanding what this diagnosis is. There, there's just all of these things that come up because we're not talking about it and we're not really taking the perspective of understanding how we need to meet these unique needs. I'd love to start by having you tell a bit about your story of how you got involved in this kind of advocacy work, because I know you have a very personal connection to it. I do. So my oldest, um, Malia, who will be nine soon, um, she is autistic and um, she got her her official diagnosis around 18 months. Um, prior to having her, I was a licensed therapist um, and I was doing advocacy work. Um, so I was familiar with autism because um, I worked within the school system with um teens and adolescents. Um, so when I had my daughter about six months, she began to show signs and characteristics of, you know, a developmental dis uh, delay. You know, she uh, had a slow response time to calling her name or saying or hearing loud noises. Um, so at one point, I actually thought she was uh, deaf. Um, and then she started with sensory issues. So I went to my husband, who is a physician, and I was like, I think you know, our, our daughter is autistic. And he was like, yeah, no, it's too early. Go uh, diagnose your clients and leave <laughs> my child alone. <laughs> so I said, okay. Um, and then at 10 months, she actually regressed in her speech. So things that she was saying with no issue became an issue. And at that point I knew, okay, we got to go to the pediatrician. So I'm sure all you parents know out there about early steps or, you know, the similar programs in your states. We went through that um, and they were like, you know, we do think she's autistic, but since she's not three, we don't want to give her the diagnosis. Go to your pediatric neurologist and they can give you the diagnosis. Okay. We all know that pediatric neurologists are hard to find. Uh -huh. So we found that single person, <laughs> <laughs> right. went to him. And he did all of his expensive and extensive testing, the DNA testing. Uh, since she was so young, she actually had to be um, put under anesthesia for her MRI, scans of her brain. And he gets his results back and he's like, yep, I do believe she is autistic as well, but I want to wait another year and a half just to make sure. Mm -hmm. um, at this point, I was just frustrated. We were already like six months into this progress uh, process. And I'm a professional, my husband's a professional, we know what's going on, we know the importance of early intervention. And I said, you know what? Okay, if that's what you feel, then I'll sit in your office every day from open until close until you give her the paperwork. Because we know that you need the official paperwork to be able to get certain services, right? 
And he didn't believe me. I sat in his office for a week. Mm. And then he was like, okay, I got to get this crazy lady out of here. <laughs> <laughs> so he gave me my paperwork and I was like, okay, we are about to get things rolling. It's going to be easy. And then my colleagues started coming to my home and they did not take any kind of uh, cultural approach. They were not thinking mm -hmm. about culturally responsive interventions. They were just taking their textbook interventions and saying, here you go, and it's going to work. And that's not what it was. Mm -hmm. And I was like, okay, this is an issue. Mm -hmm. um, so that's how Autism in Black became formed, um, knowing that people need training on being culturally responsive, knowing that it's so lonely mm -hmm. uh, for Black parents, because I would go on websites and nobody looked like me. Yeah. Um, and nobody understood the certain nuances of what it was for a Black parent raising a, a child with a disability. So that is how Autism in Black came to be. Mm. As is so often the case that the personal intersects with the professional or what we end up doing. And I think your story mirrors really what I hear from a lot of parents in general, but specifically non-white parents. There, there seems to be barriers in particular around families of Black children, non-white children being able to even access appropriate or timely diagnosis. And then the treatment is, is a whole other piece of that. I haven't looked at the stats in a while. Maybe you're more familiar with it. You know, we know that autism spectrum disorder and related um, kinds of conditions that these impact kids across the board, regardless of race, regardless of culture, regardless of, of gender. But I had seen some statistics quite a while ago that there seems to be a real gap in identification, particularly in the Black community. Is that still accurate? And can you talk a bit still, about that? Yeah, it's still very accurate. Um, it was a two-year gap, and now it's about an 18-month gap. But I tell people all the time, that's an overall gap that we're looking at. That's like the average. When we're looking and, and going by district by district, county by camp, county, we're talking about children getting diagnosed in middle school, children getting diagnosed in high school or categorized yeah. um, within the school system yeah. in, in high school. And we already know that that is you know, a, a long time of services mm -hmm. going by. Um, you know, Black children have a high rate of being misdiagnosed yeah. um, at, with any behavioral uh, di uh, diagnosis mm -hmm. other than autism. Mm -hmm. So when we know if you're not getting the right appropriate services, again, that's also going to impact you. Mm -hmm. um, and it, again, leads to school to prison pipeline. So it is such a an issue when it comes into the school factor. Mm -hmm. And then there's also that medical factor of not getting the medical diagnosis because um, healthcare professionals don't want to listen to us. I am a therapist. My husband is a physician. Mm -hmm. We were talking to our colleagues yeah. and they were still not listening to us. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think the point that you made, I want to circle back because you said that Black children are disproportionately diagnosed with emotional and behavioral disorders. And I see that all the time in my work, very quick to be labeled as a conduct disorder issue, an oppositional defiant, an emotionally impaired, whatever it may be. But it's actually the case, I think, as you're saying, that a lot of those kids, those assumptions are made that this is some sort of behavior problem, which I don't think is true for any child, but that's the subject for a whole nother podcast, right? But these yeah. kids are labeled as being a behavior problem instead of taking the perspective of, oh, is there something neurodevelopmental going on here? And I think there is a big discrepancy between how that is viewed in white children and how that is viewed in black children. Would you agree? I definitely agree. And I really think it uh, goes to the adultification of, of black children. Yes. Um, black children are seen completely different than white children. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's happened to me personally with my son who was also autistic. Um, he just got his diagnosis like a few months ago. Mm -hmm. um, in his pre-K class, he would be doing behaviors and you know, a student in his same class who was white would be doing the same behaviors, but my son was seen as being devious, being, you know, uh, aggressive, you know, they were using these terms on a four-year-old mm -hmm. and his, you know, white student in there was nothing was wrong with him. That's right. Oh, that's fine. That's what they're supposed to do. I'm like, well, 
that's what he's supposed to do as well. But he was seen as, oh, he's an issue and he can't be in this class. Mm -hmm. This class is not appropriate for him. Mm -hmm. So it happens all the time with our children. Mm -hmm. It's interesting. Um, uh, some, of, some of my listeners may not know this, but uh, they know that uh, most of them know that I have four children, but I have three sons who are white and I have a daughter who's black. And I, it was, I can so relate to what you're saying there because I didn't realize the extent of this problem until my daughter, who is not autistic, mm -hmm. um, started school in that adultification of black children. That is a real, real thing. And I so hear what you're saying with that. And as a white parent, I did not realize the true extent of that until I had a black child in the school system going through that. And so I want to speak to that for those of you who are listening and don't have personal experiences that are going, oh, you know, really, is that an issue? It's an issue. Sorry. And it's an issue in general, but it's particularly an issue when we start talking about kids with challenges and how we frame and understand and label those challenges. Exactly. Like, you know, uh, Dr. Monique Mo uh, Morris does a lot of work on Black girl push out. Yeah. Um, and, you know, just exactly what you've experienced with your daughter it is so common. You know, we're going to take away, you know, talking about disabilities and challenges and just talking about Black children in general are adultified across the board. That's right. um, and it's such a problem. You know, there's studies, the Georgetown study done on Black girls, the results were uh, Black girls needed less nurturing. And they knew more about sex, adult topics. They didn't need the caring. This is what is being said about Black girls. Mm -hmm. They're being adultified. They're adultified in a way that is hypersexualized. Yeah. Black boys are adultified in a way that is aggressive. They're always going to be aggressive. Yeah. Black girls are always going to be knowing about sex. You know, they can't wear certain things because, oh, their bodies, you know, they're always trying to, you know, exude sex, which is not true. Right. People are adultifying them mm -hmm. and seeing that. That's right. And that has implications then when we talk about the disability piece of it for how their behaviors, their challenges are viewed. And then ultimately parents' ability to get their child appropriate diagnostic, mm -hmm. um, you know, services and intervention. Yeah. It, it's, you know, baffling to me how people, especially evaluators do not even, they're not even aware of their own biases. That's right. You know, when we walk into to the door, our culture comes in with us. No matter who you are, your culture is coming in with you when you're being evaluated. Um, and if you're not familiar with Black people and you're evaluating them, then that's a problem because oftentimes our characteristics of symptoms do not match what's in the DSM. And they do not match what's in the DSM because mental health is pretty whitewashed. The DSM was created by white men on white men. I'm not a white male, <laughs> you know, so I'm not going to fit into that box right. a lot of the times. Yeah. Um, so if you're an evaluator and you're not taking culture into consideration and seeing things as deficits rather than cultural relevant information, it shows up in your evaluations. Mm -hmm. That's so critical across the board. I mean, and again, we could do an entire podcast just on that. It's such, such an important issue to bring into people's awareness. Let's talk about from your experience, both personally, as well as all of the work that you've done with Black families, what are some of the, the cultural things? What, what are some of the things that are missed or some of the things that are either seen as a cultural issue, but actually need to be viewed as diagnostically a problem or the reverse, things that are assumed to be, you know, some sort of problem or pathology, but really we should be viewing through the lens of Black culture. Can you touch on that a bit? I think one of the most important things would be the vernacular, yeah. um, how we talk, you know, um, A-A-V-E, you know, yeah. <laughs> that is a, mm -hmm. a language, you know, yeah. and we talk and we understand, but oftentimes it is seen as a deficit. Mm -hmm. um, if we use that kind of language, we're seen as uneducated, yeah. um, that we don't know. So I think that is one of the biggest things when it comes to evaluations is that it is always seen as a deficit mm -hmm. and they get marked off for that. And we know how language plays a role in evaluations, <laughs> you know? So I think that's one of the, the biggest things um, 
yeah. and also not being aware of culturally relevant information within the family. If you don't have, if you're not having that conversation with the family beforehand, asking them cultural traditions, mm -hmm. asking them about eye contact, because in yep. some cultures you do not make eye contact. That's right. Um, if you're not asking these kinds of questions before you even start your evaluation, mm -hmm. then it's going to be set up to be, you know, inaccurate. Mm -hmm. It's so true because you have to look at the child in the context mm -hmm. of everything in their life, which includes, of course, most importantly, family culture, the family system. And you're so right. If we are not understanding that, then we are interpreting what's going on with this child completely out of context or you know, in our own context, our own white perspective or our own, you know, and, and really may um, misunderstand, misinterpret some things. So I, I just, I think that's so critical. I want to ask you about the issue of stigma in the Black community when it comes to developmental disabilities, maybe more generally, maybe even more broadly mental health mm -hmm. issues, specifically autism, because, you know, I've talked with so many families over the years, and this is a real thing. There, there, there is, um, there is some stigma there. Can, can you talk a bit about, about that and your experience with that? Yeah, uh, you know, we have to deal with stigmas not only from outside of our community, but also within our community. And I think a lot of it has to deal with that society does not give Black people grace. We do not have the grace to have mental health challenges. We do not have the grace to have developmental disabilities. You know, we don't not, we do not have the grace to have disabilities in general, you know, because it's like pull, pull yourself up by your bootstraps and continue and, and do it. Um, and I think that plays a huge role in how we as a community even view it. Um, we, we view things in, in the way that, okay, no, I cannot have a disability. I cannot have a mental health challenge. If that, if I do, something is wrong with me and people are going to look at me a certain way. And how am I going to then navigate life already being a Black person now or, and then having this challenge? So I think a lot of it comes from just being fearful, yeah. um, you know, fearful of what's to come, fearful of what people are going to how people are then going to view us, you know, if my job finds out, will they fire me, you know, type of things. If my friends find out, then how are they going to view me? Because let's just be honest, a lot of information doesn't get to our community. Right. So we do not know about, you know, mental health or developmental disabilities. Um, you know, I could go to my parents' small town in Alabama, in Alabama and say autism, mm -hmm. and a lot of people will not know Yep. what it means you know they will automatically think intellectual disability yep. um and that's not it right so i mean yes you can have an intellectual disability and be autistic but you can also be autistic and not have an intellectual disability mm -hmm. you know the information doesn't get to our community so we have such wrong information that we are now now guided by fear um and shame and guilt and all of those things rolled into one and Society doesn't allow us that grace to experience emotion, uh, th those emotions. Mm -hmm. So we have to just keep pushing forward, mm -hmm. you know? So I think that's a lot of it. And then on the other hand, we have the fact that, you know, there's such a mistrust with the medical community, yeah. you know? So there's a long history of why we should be mistrustful, but um, because when we're thinking about, especially those who have um, more than one generation living in their home and they're listening to grandma and mom telling you how to raise your child and what you should do, that information is going to supersede the information of a healthcare professional a lot of times. So it, it's a lot that you can be up against. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so beautifully put. And I, I think I've had many parents, many Black parents say to me over the years, exactly what you were, you know, expressing a few moments ago, look, life is already hard enough mm. for my child being a black child in the school system or just being a black child in general. And now I'm, I'm supposed to try to understand or accept that there is something else that is going to be put on them, that people are going to view them differently as less than. And so I think there is some of this hesitancy to go down that path because it, it is fear and rightfully so of, I, I think, you know, parents of black children worry so much about them on so many levels when they don't have a disability. Yeah. And then it's like, oh, now you're telling me there's 
maybe another thing that I need to be concerned about for their well-being now and in the future. And I think it just feels like too much to so many people. It is. It, it's definitely overwhelming. I mean, the first thing that I thought of when both of my children got their diagnosis is how are interactions with the police going to be for them? Amen. That's right. You know, that's the first thing yeah. that I thought of, you know, and right. I get emotional thinking about it now because it is such a scary thing. And every client that comes to me, that's one of their worries. And I, and I tell them truthfully, I don't have an answer. There is no answer for us. We can prepare our children so much, but it's truly not their responsibility because they should be given that grace when they're having that interaction with somebody. Mm -hmm. So it, it's just a, it's such a scary situation. And I think that exemplifies this intersection of things for, I'll say ch black children with disabilities, but it's not even just children, it's you know black people, adults too with disabilities. There's these, this intersection happening there that puts them at such greater risk across the board, right? Mm -hmm. Police interactions, black children in general, that's a much higher risk. People with autism and related disabilities in general, that's a higher risk. Now we put both of those things together and you've got a black autistic child, you've just magnified that risk. And I think also with the medical community, it's difficult as a black person to get quality uh, appropriate care. It's difficult as an autistic person to get quality care. Now you put those two things together, you have a black autistic individual and you just feel like it's almost insurmountable. Like, wow, the, the convergence of these things, it really does complicate things in a way that um, people outside of the black community just can't really comprehend how, how much the intersection of those two things is problematic. It is, it is it's such a hard thing. Um, and I tell people all the time, the first thing that people see is our skin. They see that we're black. So those biases come right into play. We don't even get to the point that we have a disability. Yeah. You know, I have ADHD and people all the time tell me, oh, okay, you, you don't look like it. What does that look like? Right. <laughs> As if there's a look, right? There's an exactly. ADHD look or we wear a name tag or something. Exactly. <laughs> the same with my daughter. Oh, she, are you sure she's autistic? You know, I just, mm -hmm. it's the things, but they, they know for sure we're black. That's right. You know, those things come right on. When I go into the school system to advocate for my child, I have been met with so many stigmas asking me if my children have the same father, you know, asking if the father is even there, if, if he's in jail or prison, you know, these things that they're asking, um, automatically assuming that I am on governmental uh, government assistance, which if I was, it would be my business, right. but just the assumption, yep. the automatic assumption that only black people get, mm -hmm. you know, it, it's, it's things that like that, that make it so much harder for us to already, to navigate an already hard system. Mm -hmm. That's exactly right. So what would you say to parents who are listening to black parents who are listening um, or parents who are raising a black child who are like, yeah, that that's me. I, I haven't wanted to go down the path of diagnostic evaluation or pursuing services because I'm scared for my kid. What would, based on your experience, what would you say to those parents? I would tell parents to, you know, go ahead and do it because yeah. the school to prison pipeline is real. And a lot of times if your child is not categorized in the school system, they will be deemed a behavior problem. But a lot of times that categorization will help them and change that trajectory of school to prison pipeline. It is so real for black people. Mm -hmm. um, you know, a lot of times they're put on the school to prison pipeline once they get in uh, to, you know, the um, justice system, yep. that's when they get their categorization and that already then it's too late for us. Yep. So we have to be on top of it. We, we already know as black parents, we already have to be on top of so many things. This is just another one. Going to get an evaluation is not going to hurt your child. It's not going to harm your child. Getting your child's services is not going to harm your child unless they have somebody who doesn't know what they're doing. Right. And that's a whole nother story. Right. But making sure they get services is not going to harm them. It is going to help them prepare them, you know, to be an independent person living in society. Mm -hmm. You know, so you have to for your child, do it. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times I tell parents, look, 
we don't have the time to catch up to being okay with this. Mm-hmm. We can do it in the process of, mm-hmm. but we have to make sure that we are doing what we need to do for our black children mm-hmm. because li- we know life is not going to be easy for them. Mm-hmm. So we at least can do this one thing and then catch up to being okay with it. Educate ourselves on, on what to do. We need to make sure we're getting in and, and getting these evaluations and holding the evaluation uh, evaluators accountable to do right work with our children. So well said. What would you say are things that black parents can look for in an evaluator? You know, I mean, sometimes you get stuck with who you get stuck with, right? Like the school system's a great example. Like here's the team we have, you don't have choices. Okay. But in pursuing maybe medical evaluation or psychological evaluation outside the school system, um, treatment services, are there things that you have found as a black parent are helpful um, indicators to you that a professional might be better suited to working with your family or or maybe the, the flip of that, are there red flags? (laughs) <laughs> that you look for in someone that you might hire to work with, you know, to do services or to, to do a medical evaluation where you're like, oh, no, no, steering clear of that, going to find somebody else. Because I think that that practically is helpful for parents. It is. Um, you know, I, I tell parents all the time there are questions that we should ask because it's going to be very hard for you to to get a black one all the time. A black that's person that it's a medical professional all the time. Yeah. When we look at doctors, it's only 2%. We look at psychologists, it's only 4%. So we, oftentimes we are going to be in the room with an evaluator who is not black. Yeah. Um, so there's questions that I ask. One, I look at the paperwork. Are you asking, asking me about my culture on the intake paperwork? Uh-huh. Two, I'm going to ask you, um, have you ever evaluated a black person? <laughs> you know, that's what I'm going to ask. Um, I look forward to make sure you have culturally relevant materials in your um, your professional space. If you have a hairbrush that is not related to what we use in our home, mm-hmm. then, you know, I'm going to let you know, hey, you got to get a, a hairbrush that black people use. That's, that's <laughs> not what we use. We don't relate to that. If all of your dolls are white, We can't relate to that. If all of your materials are of white people, we can't relate to that. And if you tell me you don't see color, that is a definite red flag to me. And then I'm going to leave because I I don't have that privilege. I know I am a black person every day and you do have to treat us differently when you're working with us. And if you say you don't see color, then that is a red flag to me to know that you're not going to give me individualized treatment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So important. And I think some really practical things you said there, like for parents to be able to go on websites and look at, you know, does this professional or this clinic or this organization have culturally um, appropriate, sensitive materials on their site? Do you see people on the site or in the, you know, mailings or whatever it is that you're looking at and to not be afraid to ask those questions? Mm -hmm. I think those are important questions. I think parents in general, should feel empowered to ask more questions before um, just accepting the services of any professional who they might be working with in the medical or educational realm. But I think especially when it comes to these important issues of culture, of race, it's you know very, very appropriate. Um, and as you know, a, a white evaluator, a white service provider, it would not offend me in the slightest for a non-white parent to ask me that, I would welcome that. And if you are a black parent who feels like, I don't know, I don't want to offend somebody. If that offends somebody, then you shouldn't be working with them. And that is your, that's your litmus test right there. If you're asking those good, appropriate questions and you're getting sort of this taken aback, you know, response that, that tells you everything you need to know right there. Call the next person on the list. It does, you know, because, you know, talking about race is uncomfortable, mm-hmm. but as individuals who are not Black, you have to be okay with that discomfort, That's right. you know, because you're going to get those questions. And even me as, as a Black professional, I expect my clients to interview me. I, I expect that. You should. You should want to know who is providing you treatment. And I am okay with that as a professional, you know, because I know that whoever my children are going to, I'm going to be asking you questions. And if you seem any kind of uncomfortable or don't want to answer them, um, then I know I'm going to go and take my money elsewhere because I want them to get the care that they need. I don't need a health care professional 
messing them up. <laughs> you know, that's very important. And when we're talking about mental health professionals, it is very easy because we hold a lot of power. When we're talking about somebody's brain and, and, you know, mental health, we hold a lot of power. And if you are that uncomfortable, I'm going to take them somewhere else. That's right. That's right. And for parents to feel like that is okay. Mm-hmm. That is, and in fact, it's critically important. And Give yourself that permission. That's right. And, and you may not have, um, you know, choices within the school system, but you can still ask the questions and speak up about it. And if there is somebody working with your child or on the evaluation team or teaching your child or whatever, who is not respectful of this, who is not culturally um, informed, who is not understanding these things, then it is absolutely your right and your obligation to go to administration and request something different or request that they gain the knowledge. You don't just have to tolerate um, ignorance when it comes to people who are working with your babies. Yes, that is such a great point. A lot of times we feel like within the school system, we're stuck. Yeah. No, you have rights. Mm -hmm. Your child has rights and exercise those rights to the fullest extent. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of times schools are just winging it by what they feel is right. They don't really know the law a lot of times, but when you meet them with the actual law, then they're like, okay, we really have to do that. Yes, you do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I want to shift gears just a little bit um, and and ask, you know, we're, we're talking about the issues that parents may encounter with healthcare professionals around either getting their child an appropriate diagnosis or getting treatment services. But I wanna have you speak to these issues within the healthcare professionals community. What can and should we be doing differently to, um, to better understand the needs of black children autistic or with other disabilities and their families to better reach them with the information that they need? Because you raised an important point a few minutes ago about how this information is just not getting into um, a lot of Black communities. So what can we be doing differently or, or better on the professional end of this? One is holding yourself accountable and being honest with yourself. I think a lot of times as professionals, we are very elitist Mm -hmm. and we believe that we know all and we don't have room to be, you know, said, this is not right. Mm -hmm. (laughs) No, that's not how we should be. Um, You need to always be in a place of learning. There is no such thing as being competent in anybody's culture. Mm -hmm. I am a black woman and I will never be competent in all things black women because we are not monolithic. Um, So you need to always come from a place of learning. You definitely need to be in trainings, Mm -hmm. culturally responsive trainings on the intersections of race and disability and all the other intersections. You know, you need to be making sure you're constantly getting these trainings. It's not a one and done thing. Thing. This work will last your lifetime, you know, so as professionals, and again, be okay from with that discomfort, because a lot of times you will grow within that discomfort. So it's okay to know that, okay, this is this is a little uncomfortable for me. I'm, I'm out of my comfort zone. That's okay, because you're going to grow within that. And also know that it's not a perfect process, you will mess it up. And it's okay, because you can apologize and continue to move forward with that. So that's the advice I always give professionals. Mm-hmm. And what, what are some of the questions we should be asking when we start working with, like for, for my um, professionals listening who are in the educational realm or in the therapy or you know medical realm, um, for people who aren't aware of these things, what suggestions would you have as a starting point? What questions? should we be asking when we have uh, a black family or or, uh, let's just say a a family of any culture or race or background that is different from our own what what are some opening questions or some ways that we can open up that dialogue and get a better understanding before we just dive right into testing the kit you know i think first you have to be aware of your own biases so you need to check those biases with what well, whoever you're dealing with, whatever culture you're dealing with, you should be checking yourself and saying, okay, well, what are some of the biases I have 
with this particular culture and be honest with yourself about that. Because if you're not, then you're going to go in there and those biases are going to be coming in and you're not going to be able to check them. Mm -hmm. And then when you get in there with the family, you need to start asking those kinds of questions. You know, is there anything about your culture I should be aware of? Is there anything about your family that I should be aware of? When dealing with Black people, asking about um, depression and anxiety, that might get you a no answer, but asking about sadness or, you know, does this make you have, you know, butterflies in your stomach? Asking ways around that, you know, with some of the feeling work will get you those answers that you're looking for. Um, Because a lot of times we do not have diagnosis for the older people in our family. So we don't know if there's a history or not. But if you Mm -hmm. begin to ask questions about characteristics and symptomology, then you're probably going to get that answer. Because Mm -hmm. a lot of times what happens with my colleagues is they've asked about depression and anxiety and suicide attempts. And it's like, no, 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 no. And then in session, they'll be explaining and be like, well, you said no. I'm like, oh, that's what that is. I didn't know what that was. Yeah. You know, so you have to ask around it. Well, I think what that makes me think about is especially when we're thinking, um, you know, in the realm of um, autism spectrum disorder or neurodevelopmental disabilities, it's it's way less likely that somebody is going to mark a family history of those things because they probably weren't ever diagnosed or diagnosed properly. So the importance of, as you just said, asking around more um, symptoms, how they may be presented, you know, tell, tell me about, you know, your uncle so-and-so to, to get a better idea because there may well be some genetic links, some, some family history there, but it just hasn't been labeled as such. And that's a really important thing, especially from a diagnostic standpoint to be inquiring about. It is, you know, there's actually people in my family who are autistic and I did not even know until my daughter got the diagnosis and I created autism in black. And it was like, okay. And a lot of other black families, they'll be like, well, you know, that's just how uncle Joe is. No, uncle Joe is autistic. Uh Right. So, you know, we give it that pass, that excuse of, you know, oh, that's just how they are. That's just how they act. Mm -hmm. You know, not knowing that they act that way because they have an actual disability. Uh, because, you know, my grandparents were definitely not taking, you know, my mom or any of her siblings in to get a, a diagnosis, right. you know, and a lot of times my mom and her siblings weren't doing that with me and my cousins. Mm-hmm. So you you really have to, to get around and navigate through those questions, because a lot of times if you're using the actual diagnosis label, mm-hmm. we're, we're, gonna, we're just going to say no, because it is no. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Oh, so important. You shared just so many great insights, so many great practical tips. We could talk for hours about this, but I know that we we need to um, wrap up here, but I do want to make sure that you tell people where they can find out more about the work that you're doing about Autism in Black, because I know we have a lot of people who are going to want to get more information. Sure. My website is www.autisminblack.org. On Instagram, I am Autism in Black, the same on Twitter. On Facebook, I am Autism in BLK. And my email is info at autisminblack.org. Fantastic. And we will have all those with the show notes for those of you to go and find it um, you know, at the website. But please do access um, those resources. Uh, follow Maria on social media. Um, She's got great resources on her website as well. And I know you do quite a bit of speaking and training yourself, and that's a great opportunity for families and professionals to be able to access, really dig in more deeply with some of these things. Yes, I have a three-part culturally responsive training that a lot of organizations have hired me to do for their organization. I have the Autism in Black podcast, um, which is for parents, professionals, everybody who just wants to uh, learn more. Um, We just had our first ever Autism in Black conference, which was amazing. Um, And we will be having those uh, replays available for purchase soon. So yes, go to the website, check out um, the podcast on any of your favorite podcasts streaming platforms. And uh, you can find out about my trainings as well on the website. Fantastic. Maria, thank you so much, not only for being here today and sharing your wisdom and experience with us, but really for the incredible and important work that you are doing around all of this in the world. Really, really grateful to you. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. And thanks as always to all of you for being here and listening. We'll catch you back here next time for our next episode of the Better Behavior Show.